Imagine that a spaceship from a very advanced alien civilization reaches Earth. They survey the planet from space and observe that there are forests and oceans on the one hand and artificial geometrically shaped structures like buildings, cities and roads, even flying objects like airplanes. And in between the forests and the cities, there seem to be millions of acres of something green but not quite a forest. This third category is what we are interested in, but we will get to that in just a bit. Back to the aliens, as humans, we assume they will go, hmm, the life form that made all these buildings and factories must be the dominant species on this planet. Let's go talk to them. This is called the anthropocentric bias, where we tend to place humans at the center of our thinking and it distorts our ability to look at ecosystems. So it is sometimes useful to let go of this natural human ego and look at things slightly differently. So I'd like to offer an alternative storyline. The aliens don't decide who the big boss of the planet is merely on the basis of who builds cities, factories and roads, but take a more ecosystem approach. They look at which species of life form effectively controls the existence of human beings. And that would be grass. Surprised? Let me convince you. Yes, the family of plants called Poaceae that specifically all have jointed stems, narrow leaves and seed-bearing flowers cover 40% of the earth's surface and human beings would go extinct without them. It's almost as if it's hard to figure out if human beings have domesticated grass or if grass has domesticated human beings and forced us to grow them in massive amounts wherever we live. Not just for food, pasture for animals, and even backyard lawns where the humble grass has convinced us to kill every other living thing so that it alone can grow for no useful reason at all. Genetically and evolutionarily speaking, it's hard to argue against the fact that grass has been astonishingly successful. Four of the top five agricultural commodities in the world are grasses. Sugarcane, maize, which is corn, rice, wheat, and potato. And in this video, we are going to look at the one grass that feeds more people on the planet than any other food crop, rice. Rice is a seed of the grass species Oryza sativa, which is Asian rice, or Oryza glabarima, which is African rice. And then there is wild rice from a range of grass species, including some uncultivated species of Oryza. Rice is a staple food for more than half the world's human population, especially in Asia and Africa. It is the third most produced agricultural commodity in the world after sugarcane and maize. While sugarcane and maize are used for important non-food purposes, alcohol and fuel as well, it can be said that rice is the single most important crop with respect to human nutrition and calorie intake. Being the source of more than one-fifth of the calories consumed by humans globally. Experts believe rice may have been domesticated in China anywhere from 13,000 to 8,000 years ago and then traveled to other parts of the world, including India, where it is expected to have reached the Gangetic Plain around 7,000 years ago. Rice is grown in two stages. The seedlings are first grown close together in a flooded field and then transplanted to another field with a bit more spacing. A farmer I spoke to many years ago told me that growing the seedlings close together originally had the effect of stunting the height of the rice plant. Wild rice was originally very tall and made it hard to harvest the grains. And then transplanting it with more spacing led it to grow enough seeds for us to harvest. Most modern varieties of rice have hybridized many times over the centuries and therefore don't actually grow tall but the first stage still makes a difference in eliminating weeds and pests that cannot live in flooded conditions. Enough history. Let's get straight to the practical food science of rice. At this point, 
we're going to head into the kitchen and look at the most common varieties of rice you're likely to encounter. And I have with me Master Chef Aruna Vijay, who's going to take us through the process of cooking rice. Like any cereal grain, rice has a tough, inedible outer husk, a very micronutrient rich bran and germ, which is the baby rice plant, and a starchy endosperm whose role is to feed the baby as it grows into a tiny rice plant. If you leave the bran and germ on, you get brown rice. But the bran also has fat, which goes rancid over time. This is where you get rice bran oil. So brown rice has very short shelf life. While it's nice and healthy, we cannot possibly feed the planet only brown rice. So that is why rice has historically been polished. Let's start with polished and unpolished rice. Human beings figured out quite a while back that a diet of only polished rice was resulting in all manner of health problems. Problems we would later come to know as vitamin deficiencies. And then they figured out that partially boiling the entire grain pushed the nutrients from the bran into the endosperm, thus resulting in significantly more nutritious parboiled rice. In fact, most people who consume rice daily tend to consume parboiled rice. Raw rice is suitable for special occasion dishes like biryani, pulao, etc. The second way to categorize rice is starch composition. Rice is mostly starch and it has two kinds of starch. The harder, waxier amylose and the loose and sticky amylopectin. When a rice variety has more amylose, it tends to be firmer and stickless. More amylopectin means stickier and softer. Amylose is harder to digest than amylopectin, but most rice varieties vary very little in the ratio of amylose and amylopectin. The difference is usually just texture and flavor. Different cuisines and different dishes prefer specific varieties of rice in India. Examples of high amylose rice, Basmati, Sona Masuri, and low amylose, Ponni, Gobindabhog. Let's start cooking rice. The first step is washing and rinsing. In general, when we wash and rinse rice, there is a common myth that it is done to remove starch. Rice is mostly starch. What happens when you rinse is that you remove a small amount of loose starch, amylose and amylopectin. It's not like you're going to meaningfully reduce any calories. If you're rinsing 100 grams of rice, you are at best going to wash off less than a few grams. So if you don't, that's fine. The rice will stick a bit more after cooking and that is okay for many South Indian dishes. But if you're making pulao or biryani, doing this a few times will prevent the rice from sticking once it cooks. One good reason to always wash and rinse is to remove other chemical impurities that might have been introduced during the polishing process. Now let's get to soaking. This is an optional step depending on what dish you're cooking. Soaking rice allows the grain to absorb a small amount of water. More absorption will happen only when you heat the rice. This initial absorption helps the starch cook more evenly once you start heating the water. This step is less important when making boiled rice for a South Indian or Southeast Asian meal, but important when making biryani or pulao. Typically, 20 to 30 minutes is more than enough. Then we come to estimating water. This is typically the trickiest skill one needs to learn when it comes to cooking rice. Too much water and your rice turns to mush, and too little and it is undercooked. The internet will tell you all manner of hacks and ratios to do this. The fascinating fact is that the most scientific way to do this is how your grandmother likely did it. The science is simple. Rice will absorb water in a one is to one ratio by volume, meaning just enough water to cover the rice. Then we need to add extra water to account for the fact that water will evaporate during the cooking process. If you're cooking in an open pot or an electric rice cooker, first pour just enough water to get to the level of the rice. Then add enough additional water to come up to the first joint of your index finger. This is generally considered a good starting point. And here is how you might need to adjust this going forward. 
if you are making pulao or fried rice, you want to use a little less than one index finger if you like the rice al dente, meaning with a little bit of bite. Otherwise, this amount is fine. For South Indian dishes where the rice is expected to be softer, you can add a little bit more than one index finger level. If you are using a pressure cooker or instant pot, use a little less than one index finger because there is less moisture escaping a pressure cooker. Now I know all of you probably have this question. I was told one is to two ratio by all these recipes on the internet. That is actually fine. For one cup of rice, for typical South Indian rice, you might need to use one is to 1.5 for biryani or pulao. The ratio method is perfectly fine for one cup of rice. Once you need to cook a bit more, the ratios do not scale. You will end up adding way too much water. Now let's get to cooking time. If it's a pressure cooker, lower heat, one whistle, and then measure six minutes. And that is usually enough for rice. But if you're cooking on an open pot, bring to a boil, then wait till the water reduces and reaches the surface of the rice, and then lower heat, and then close the lid, and let the rice absorb the rest of the water. This can take 10 to 15 minutes. After that, shut down the heat and let the pot stay closed for 10 to 15 more minutes, and then open it and fluff it up with a fork. There is another method for cooking rice, and in fact, if you go to Indian villages, this method has been used for the longest time. And it is also used when you make biryani. When you're making rice for a biryani, you do not have to worry about the amount of water. You can just simply go ahead and add extra water. But the key thing to remember is two things. Number one, salt. Your water needs to taste as salty as the sea. If you live in a place that is not by the sea, take a trip to Chennai and do a taste test. It's important. No, I'm just kidding. This will feel like a bit too much, but do not worry. All of the salt is not going to be absorbed by the rice. Two, time. You then cook the rice till it's almost fully, but not fully cooked. It needs to have a bit of bite al dente. You can also add spices along with a little bit of fat to the water if you want to add aromas to the rice. And then you drain the excess water and use that rice to layer your biryani. Remember that myth about soaking and rinsing rice to reduce calories? Actually, this ancient method of cooking will reduce 10 to 20% of overall calories because a fair bit of the starch will actually be drained out. Now let's look at some common rice myths. Here are five common rice myths that we're going to debunk. Number one, is rice healthy? Rice is a cereal grain and therefore mostly carbohydrates. Further, we tend to consume polished rice and not the whole grain. So what little micronutrients, protein and fat that is there in the seed, we don't eat. And a diet heavy in grains, be it millets, rice or wheat, is not healthy. But rice is the staple carbohydrate for South and East India and all of East and Southeast Asia. Instead of thinking just in terms of rice, it makes better sense to think of the entire meal. A meal with modest portions of rice and a lot of vegetables, protein, and not too much fat is a healthy meal. And rice can be a part of it. Does washing and rinsing rice reduce calories by removing the starch? Different rice varieties, be it basmati, sona masuri, gobindu bhog, there are no significant differences in nutrition. Rice is not very micronutrient dense to begin with, but the kind of processing does make some difference. Brown or red rice has more of the bran and therefore has more micronutrients, but it has a short shelf life. And there is also concern about the presence of arsenic, which is absorbed from the soil. Parboiled rice is an excellent compromise. It has more vitamins than polished raw rice. It's best to consume parboiled rice as your staple and use raw rice for special occasions like biryani or pulao. Are there health and nutritional benefits in different rice varieties? Why do we feel sleepy after eating rice? Since rice is an easily digested carbohydrate, a lot of glucose will enter your blood from the small intestine in about 30 minutes after you eat rice. 
and your pancreas will produce insulin to bring that blood sugar down, mostly by converting it to fat. And then your blood sugar will crash. And that sends a signal to the brain that you are out of energy and your brain will nudge you to sleep. This is why modern day medicine tells us not to consume too much rice, wheat or sugar since they tend to go through this glucose spike and crash cycle too fast for our bodies to adjust. This is why we need to eat a moderate amount of rice and a lot of vegetables and protein and some fat and that will cause a more gradual spike and reduction so you will not feel sleepy after eating a meal. Is it true that cold overnight refrigerated rice has fewer calories? Actually, this is one rare example of internet viral content that happens to be true. Starch absorbs water and expands when you cook it. And as it comes back down to room temperature, it hardens and crystallizes. This process is called retrogradation. And this is why rice kept even for a while at, in the kitchen becomes hard. As it hardens, the retrograded starch is harder to digest. And that's a good thing. We do not want rapid digestion, glucose spiking and crashing. So overnight refrigerated rice retrogrades a lot more. And it's a good idea for heavy rice eaters looking to improve their health. To finish, here is an excerpt from a 10th century Tamil poem. Aadai udupom adan pinne par choru. மூடனை பெய்து முழங்கை வழிவார் கூடி இருந்து குளிர்ந்தேலோர் எம்பாவாய் As we pour the ghee on top of milk and rice and relish it as it trickles down our elbow, we shall enjoy all these in your company. So enjoy your rice in the company of loved ones in moderation.